welcome everybody. Many have returned. By choosing that sort of as a title, I hope you realise it's going to be quite light-hearted. And I wanted really that lovely Irish song about the spinning wheel, a wheel within a wheel that keeps on turning. There is no beginning, there is no end. But unfortunately, I didn't actually have time to find the tape because that sort of research takes hours. Mm. When you talk from the top of your head with information you already have, it's, you know, it is much easier. But you see, where, the, where is there a beginning on a wheel? So I'm going to actually take a, a bicycle tyre. The bicycle tyre gives us a point where at the air intake. So I'll start there with Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. So we have air in our tyre and it's ready to go to be added to the rest of the bicycle and to be pedalled, to be motivated by us individually created from the one source where sparks from a spiritual fire or chips off the old block whichever way you like to look at incarnation <coughs> the beginning might have been like Kay's allium that she gave me I think that's the most wonderful shape mm. the middle and then the sparks that fly off with the seeds in the end so we are those seeds probably put beautifully in shorthand in the Bible for us. There are many great creation stories, but creation really is an expression of love because when you feel creative, you actually feel it coming from inside you and God's creation was an expression of love, like our children for us is, was an expression of our love. If that's uncomfortable for you, call it the Big Bang, but I think probably most of us here were qu are quite happy if I just use the shorthand and call it God. It's echoed in nature everywhere. Mother Nature is a great manifestation and teacher of the divine. We, of course, are the greatest, but Mother Nature can teach us everything we need to know if we actually are aware of what's going on in Mother Nature. So, it's about time, if we're the greatest, that we lived up to our birthright. If we could only remember why, how, who, etc. Who we are. So, I'm just sort of saying, coming at the point where I am at, and I know that I'm physical, I know that I have an etheric body, I know that I have an astral body, and I know that I have a spiritual body. So, when I talk about us human beings, I sort of accept all that. Here, the Bible is actually our next book of clues on our treasure hunt because our life is a treasure hunt. And the Bible is a book of clues. They're not obvious, they're often deeply hidden, they're often misinterpreted, but it is our book of clues. And what are we looking for, really? We're looking for the crock of gold at the end of the rainbow. So we turn to our book of clues and we look at the story of the rainbow. And we find that it was a covenant between God and ourselves that he would be always with us. He had one or two changes of mind once or twice and had to be persuaded not to get rid of humanity altogether. And it appears after the clearing of a rainstorm, a rainbow appears when there's been a great clearing and a wind and a rain and the light comes again. And there is the rainbow to remind us of God's covenant. And inside us we have the chakra colored aura system of the rainbow again. So it's without and it's within. And it's a sort of really consoling promise. So there is a constancy and a cleansing and a revitalizing every time we need it. It is the great law of cause and effect showing itself. And I think the light has to shine through the water at an angle of about 45 degrees to split the colours, is what I remember from long ago. We are made in God's image. We're not actually made like him yet. That's the bit we've got to do. We're made in God's image. And our potential is deep within us. And in the Piscean age, the potential was sort of egged on by suffering, I'm afraid, and purification. Pisces has been quite a hard 2,000 years Jesus the Christ came in at the very beginning of those 2,000 years 
at the probably one of the lowest points in the evolution of mankind. We've got to achieve our individual Christhood or Christ consciousness for this sort of next, well, the 2,000 years gone and probably more than 2,000 years to come. It was a sort of beginning for us. Christ was a sort of beginning on this wheel that has no beginning. It was definitely a great shove up the backside for mankind in his evolutionary path. John Macefield writes, but, you know, we can't, like a lot of literature, art, etc. tells us, we can't do it all in one go. Be perfect. But you see, it's in many lifetimes. It's not in one lifetime. John Mayfield writes, I hold that when a person dies, his soul again returns to earth, arrayed in some new flesh disguise. Another mother gives him birth. With sturdier limbs and brighter brain, the old soul takes the road again. Such is my belief and trust, this hand, this hand that holds the pen, has many a hundred times been dust, and turned to dust and dust again. These eyes of mine have blinked and shone in Thebes, in Troy, and Babylon. And I shall know in angry words, in jibes and mock, and many a tear, a carrion flock of homing birds, the jibes and scorns I uttered here. The brave words that I fail to speak will brand me dastard on the cheek. And as I wander on the road, I shall be helped and healed and blessed. Dear words shall cheer me as goads to urge the heights before unguessed. My road shall be the road I made. All that I gave shall be repaid. So shall I fight, so shall I tread in this long war beneath the stars. So shall glory wreathe my head, so shall I faint and show the scars, until this case, this clogging mould, be smithied all to kingly gold. So that's our target. That's where we're heading, hopefully, and where we eventually, with something like that shining before us, that there is a goal and there is a target. Um, it gives us hope. Um, hope brings eternal, doesn't it? Fortunately. I often think of that hymn. When I wake up in the morning, it's almost as I'm singing it, new every morning is for love. You go to bed absolutely shattered, and you think, you know, I can't go on. And then you wake up in the morning, your etheric and your astral body and your spiritual, though your etheric has been attached to your physical, have left during the night and become resuscitated and <laughs> revitalized. So that by the morning again, you suddenly feel, ah, the sun rises. You can cope with another day. And so from the expression of love, we are on our way. We've begun pedalling on our bike, as it were. On your bike, that's a lovely phrase. It stops us being static and stagnant. Edgar Cayce's early readings I'll go into, because you've actually got to have incarnation before you have reincarnation. So I'll just briefly go back to the beginnings. And the prophet writes about it too, Gaia Gibran's the prophet. Mm -hmm. Forget not that I shall come back to you. A little while and my longing shall gather dust and foam for another body. A little while, a moment of rest upon the wind, and another woman shall bear me. And in the garden of the prophet, he also says at the end, O oh, mist, my sister, my sister mist, I am one with you now. No longer am I a self. The walls have fallen and the chains have broken. I rise to you a mist, and together we shall float upon the sea until life's second day, when dawn shall lay you dewdrops in a garden and me a babe upon the breast of a woman. And he uses the word mist for the all-enveloping, creative, vaporized, spiritual essence from which we've come. And in the Ed one of the early Edgar Cayce readings, he says, Water is symbolic of the source of life in the earth and is the first materialization of spirit. King James' a version of the Bible reads, There went up a great mist from the earth and the first creation 
came from that mist. So it was interesting that Gael Gibran also uses mist. Then we get the creation of souls right in the beginning. And one of these readings for um, a person who was alive in the 30s, in the beginning when all forces were given in the spiritual force, and the morning stars sang together in the glory of the coming of the Lord and the God to make the giving of man's influence and the developing in the world's forces. This entity was there. I mean, that's amazing that he's actually giving a reading in the 30s to somebody who was at the beginning of the Earth's evolution and creation because we are talking about our planet of now. And another one, when the earth forces were called into existence and the sons of God came together and the sounding of the coming of man was given, this entity was there. Another one, this entity in the beginning when the first of the elements were given and the forces set in motion that brought about this sphere called the earth plane and when the morning stars sang together and the whispering winds brought the news of the coming of man's indwelling of the spirit of the creator he man became the living soul the entity came into being with this multitude so the shorthand version we've got in the bible our, our tr book of clues talks about Adam as one it's shorthand it's condensed it's a clue but it's actually a multitude that came in together like the alum with all the seeds on it and it's sort of interesting to know that Casey says at that time the multitude came together and gradually we lost our way. We could go into the physical earth plane, enjoy it, come out and go back to the origins of spirit. But we started having too good a time. And as the time went on, we actually couldn't get back out again. It's almost like a bit of flotsam or jetsam that the tide is brought up onto the beach, the wave withdraws and it's left stranded. And we have forgotten how to get back to our spiritual origins. So I'll go back through um, the Jesus incarnations of the soul that was Jesus because he volunteered first of all as Emilius to come in to help those who were stranded and who couldn't actually find their way back to find their way back. But they wouldn't listen. They were having too good a time at the party and the last bus had gone. So he returns to the spirit and says, look, I'm sorry, I failed, but they won't listen. So the Adamic body was specially created for man's return. And so the Jesus soul was, had volunteered to come back as Adam. First of all, he was one, like an amoeba. The male and the female were together. They weren't split. And the second chapter of Genesis, they get split. Because man, as one whole, is alone. I mean, even sort of gay or lesbian people who say they have no expression are almost a male and female body in one. You're almost getting sort of back to that. It's very interesting. But they don't like living alone because alone or one and alone are sort of spelt the same. And we are created by God for companionship. He created us for a relationship and companionship. And everybody needs companionship and everybody needs some sort of relationship. So he split the male and female and ever since he took out of Adam's rib, what have the two sexes been doing? getting back together again so if you split something that's meant to be actually whole they spent the whole time trying to get back together and in this Adamic world also the fallen angel Lucifer Revelation says that 12 says there was war in heaven and Michael cast out the dragon so we got him on the earth and Lucifer gave us our free will he was given permission to give us free will to test our free will and see what we do with it, like we do with our children. We bring up our children, we aren't in control, they have free will, and look what happens. Mm -hmm. So we were allowed to, Lucifer was allowed to tempt to them and to exercise their free will, which they did, as we all know about the apple. After we'd exercised our free 
we were by eating of the very tree that we were told not to. That was the fall, the fall from the truly spiritual, which the original Adamic body was. We fell into matter in a big way. So when people talk about the fall, it's a transition from spirit into matter. We became densely physical, and the only way we could return was the death of the physical. So, like a bicycle tire that goes flat after a journey, we could return and get pumped up again for our next life. And we needed that, that sort of state of death to get us going. Reincarnation, made of the dust of the earth and dense, with a puncture in our tire, that's how we were. We had to go back. So death is vital to the human condition before we can actually get going. So the next incarnation of Adam was Enoch, who was a teacher and a scribe. He's Hermes and Thoth. He's given different names in the Roman and the Greek. But he was not fully human because he didn't experience death. He was still sufficiently spiritual that he thought he could do a rescue. Then came Melchizedek was the next one. But again, he had no, Melchizedek had no death. So he was still not like us earth souls. And he, Melchizedek, Casey says, wrote the book of Job. And in Job, you get the tussle between the devil and God for somebody's soul. And the say, say, Satan says, I bet you he only stays with you because you're nice to him. So poor old Job goes through all those trials to see if he still believes in God. And of course, at the end he does, but he does have a very hard time. Well, apparently Melchizedek, the, the, the original Jesus soul, wrote the book for us. So then he came in truly human as Joseph. He was born of woman, he married, had children, and he died. So that was the first really human sort of rescue package we had from Joseph. Then Joshua, land chosen for the sort of body to come through that would be a true saviour of the world. But as Joshua, he of course you know he had many, many battles and he slew many, many people. And actually the Jesus soul started to incur a bit of karma from that lifetime. Okay. Oh, oh, right. Right. Then he came in as Asaph, the musician to David, artist and prophet who wrote a lot of the Psalms. Mm. Jeshua, the next one, who helped rebuild the temple with Zechariah. And then and the ninth one, well, we don't, he had several others, but these were the important ones that really affected the life he had as the Christ. Then was the father of Zoaster, who wrote the Zend of Vesta. So he's also, as a scribe as Enoch, left a lot of writings. And, he, and there's Melchizedek writing the book of Job. And here we have him again, setting up the Zoastrian holy book. At this point, Jesus' soul no longer had to return to earth, but volunteered to carry on to anchor the really saving Christhood into the earth, which means that it was a voluntary thing. He became a volunteer and that Jesus' soul no longer actually needed. And we do that too, apparently. Eighteen lives that Katie gave no longer needed reincarnation, but they have volunteered, some of them, to come back again. So, yeah, so that wonderful book, Reincarnation Unnecessary. That's about right. About those 18 people. Yes. Yeah. And so we have Jesus the last one that you know is uh, important we don't know about the second coming you could almost call the second coming yet another one to come but he was known either as Jeshua or Joshua or the Greek name for the soul was Jesus so it's easier again as our Bible tells us it's Jesus he says before Abraham was I am so that gives you another clue right in the end that Reincarnation was just something that everybody accepted in New Testament and Old Testament times. And a body had to be prepared for this terrific Christ energy to come in. Because when you think of a spiritual sun and the energy, even in the physical sun, it is, an, it is tremendous. It had to be a pure body that hadn't experienced the fall from 
spirit into matter to become material. So it had to be strong and pure enough to hold the Christ energy from the spiritual sun to deliver to mankind an anchor in the earth with a shedding of blood upon the earth. The Christ energy for the planet and for the whole of mankind was anchored at the crucifixion when the blood went into the earth rather like a salt solution you put a bit of salt into a glass and it actually affects the whole water the spilling of Christ's blood on the earth actually had exactly the same spiritual effect it was anchored in the earth for everyone race, creed, didn't matter it was part of the earth mother earth's evolution it is still here I and mean, we have to just follow Jesus' example and access the energy that he left all around us and it's one of those things that even though it's there because we can't see it we have to go through some sort of journey to realize that it is all around us he didn't actually ask you see to be worshipped he asked to be followed his ex was an example his life was an example as well as this terrific um, mission he had of bringing the Christ energy onto the earth and at the cross he said it is finished he had done what he had come to do and so he said it is finished it was finished for him but it's not finished for us because it wasn't done vicariously for us it was done to show us and give us an example so we've got an awful lot of work to do and um, I'll find out where Casey says um, when Jesus said on the cross it is finished he meant that his earthly mission of showing the way to overcome sin had been achieved it had been done by meeting and overcoming his prior errors this contest concept is borne out in one possible interpretation of his word, words it is finished the debt is paid and so for him his compulsory things were finished but each life of Christ you see gave him and taught him an awful lot each life of the master has made a living example for us to follow Emilius the spirit Adam the created Enoch or Hermes the great initiate and sage Melchizedek a mystical priest Joseph because he gave the first bread and wine to Abraham and okay. brought, yes, brought us into the communion the Eucharist that the church today knows Joseph was the head of state and a forgiver that was interesting that the Jesus' soul's lessons on forgiveness came in the Joseph life as well Joshua the faithful warrior leader Asaph the artisan, Jeshua the priest and scribe, Zend the spiritual leader, and Jesus who loved and suffered his way to the Christhood. The pattern of each of these lives of the Master is charged and enlivened, however, by the power of his ultimate Christ energy that came into him in the last three years of his life. And that is what our journey is all about, to follow exam his example. When we worship, I never really like that word, but it's actually a reverence that comes with awe. And it comes with recognition when you yourself recognize something higher and better than yourself. And with gratitude. You find that gratitude, when you're grateful for something, it's a great mover. It moves you on quite a bit. A church or a society is just a meeting place where people pool their energy to create a greater one and to share experiences. So when I go to church today, it, I know I'm just pooling my energies and prayers. You build a force that is larger than you alone, or the sum of just the parts, as we're told. But unfortunately, the Romans formalized and united everything, and so much misinterpretation came about and Constantine and I suppose Justinian were the main responsibles who threw out reincarnation from Christ's teachings and created a summary we call the Bible because Constantine started gathering together the books to put in the Bible and we only have a very brief shorthand version of a very brief summary from which we have to look for these vital clues that are hidden 
but it is all there. These clues have not been totally written out of our treasure hunt. We have the choice and the responsibility. Our life is in our own hands, and we are our own archaeological dig. But to remember it all would be too much. We have vague memories through all sorts of things, of perhaps past lives, but to take on the responsibility and the anguish of previous lives, you can't cope with it all at once. Plato in his Republic was interesting because he also um, in the Republic gives you the choosing of your next incarnation of souls and how they chose and were free almost to choose to make them more just to make them more balanced so even if you came in with a lot of riches you still had to learn to be balanced. If you came poverty stricken, you still had to learn to be balanced and to be just. And he advises in the Republic to take the middle course and avoid as far as we can this life of extremes. But us, and having owed his goodness to habit, Plato says that if you owe your goodness to habit rather than philosophy and thinking, you've actually not got many brownie points. And the way they go to the various people to get their life and to have it spun, um, and the guardian spirit first let it, led the next soul to Clotho, thus ratifying beneath her hand and whirling her spindle the lot the person had chosen. And after saluting her, he led it to the next one, where Atropus spins, so making the threads of its destiny irreversible. So you come into destiny there, where a destiny is irreversible. We know that we can alter our destiny if we, tend, if we come to using our spirit and our will. That's how we get round it. Wordsworth, too, is interesting because in his Otorm Immortality, he says how we can't take on too much. And our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, had elsewhere had its setting and cometh from afar, not entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, so we have got some memories taking with us, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. So we take on what we can, but it is just not possible for us to take on. We sometimes mumble about it, but I don't actually think we really want to know everything. You can, through regression, get in touch with something, but how, you know, you've got to work out how reliable it is. Talents like Mozart has been brought across to another life. When they appear so early in life, you know that it's come with them in spirit. People on their dress often give clues as to what sort of life they have. I've got a great friend who does regression, and she said when the people work through the door, it's the way they're dressed that often gives her her first clues that, of what they're going to say. Your likes and dislikes and things and the periods of history you're drawn to are also great clues to past lives. Um, yes, that anchoring of the Christ energy is for everybody and that we choose the lifetimes in different nationalities and different creeds in different lands should actually make us much more forgiving and much more tolerant because the law of cause and effect actually is we forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. So you only get forgiven as much as you are forgiving. Again, you've got the law of karma, but you've got a terrific sort of balance and justice there. Divi divinity often speaks to our conscience. That is often the clue to a past life. If you suddenly get a conscience about something, uh-uh, been there, well, you know, got the t-shirt, don't go there again. That is a very worthwhile thing listening to your conscience because something in you has told you that you've already learnt that lesson because you know. So listen to our consciences. When we're incarnating, Casey says that one of the greatest effects is the astrological planets that we visit because they all have such, ex such strong influence. And if you have a stay in the planet, you get a strength that you bring in with you. Like if you go to Jupiter, you learn to deal with large groups. You have a great ability. Casey's sister w was in Jupiter before she came down. She was head of the Red Cross 
in her part of America. She enjoyed large groups. And those abilities, Casey said, came from Jupiter. Saturn gives you ability to withstand great tests, as if you've been burnt in a furnace. Mars gives you learning and strength. But if the influence of the planets has to come through your aura, and if your aura is a bit mucky, Mars's strength will come in, actually, as strength without any moral code. But if warlike, in other words, going to war, Mars the god of war. But if the strength you got from Mars comes through a, the aura that is much sort of purer, the influence will be to strengthen you. So we have an influence on how the planets influence us. But Casey said that that actually was a third great influence on your life. Your first is your free will, and nobody, unless you give it away, can take it away. The second is your karma. That is definitely built up there on the other plane for you to pick up your karmic coat and, coat and come back in again. But the astrological is your third great influence. And if you live through it, you can actually pass through it. And you may get to a point when your astrological star sign doesn't really have an effect on you anymore. You have used your spirit between destiny and between providence. Destiny is written by your na last life. Your last life wrote your destiny for this one. And if you can use your free will, which is your spirit, to push yourself out of your destiny into providence, you actually can alter or push on your, your life so that you really achieve quite a lot in a life on earth. So, you know, Ivanov said of spirit and destiny too. To escape destiny, you must overcome weakness and stop submitting passively to a life filled with things over which you have no control. Only breathing, eating, procreating and sleeping. That kind of life is far from the divine life. It is divine in that it comes from God, but it is not divine in the spiritual sense. The divine life begins when a man realizes he is not made of he is made of more than flesh and bone and muscle, that he is not all stomach and sex, but also spirit, and that he is meant to act and create in the spiritual realm and devote his life to something more, something sublime, luminous and divine. Then yes, he escapes his destiny, but not completely. The destiny of falling ill and being left in the cemetery to rot, that destiny is fixed, because I am speaking of the physical plane and there is nothing one can do. But the spiritual life gives us an opportunity to add something more to the instinctive life and to reach a higher plane beyond destiny. In order to do that, the spirit must be allowed to manifest itself and leave its imprint on your life to intervene in everything you do. In that way you avoid your destiny and enter another realm where providence begins. The destiny of the body is to return to dust and ashes, but not the spirit. Spirit has no destiny. It comes under the heading of providence. And providence, if you look it up in the dictionary, means the guardianship of a deity. So he, you have triggered the law of grace, where when you have moved one step, God and his angels come in to meet you. And so we probably see the big issues that are our destiny before we come in we may see that we're going to be in a wheelchair. But maybe the choices of how we get there are ours. <laughs> you may see big events in your life that you've promised to do. But how you get there and who you share it with often a part of your free will and choices. We choose our sex, our parents, our country, or if we work in a state of harmony with the cosmos, we will always be able to see beauty and light, however murky everything gets. Above the clouds, the sun is always shining. And the I am with you always. That was a, problem, a promise from the covenant of the rainbow as well. And the I am, you see, because I am is our, our individuality. And the Jesus soul had an I am. Everybody has an I am. You and I have an I am. And that's one thing that will never leave us. We also have to 
raise the evolution of mankind so we're actually a trans forming evil at each stage we go through and if we play our cards right we'll get a better deck next time but sometimes you can't alter the deck you've got this time to start on the next round of the spiral phew it actually is exhausting to think about it um, that's one of the reasons why the church gave us only one lifetime because if you try spreading it and thinking of all those lifetimes it actually gives you a bit too big a horizon and you won't stress the now and in the now, we make our future. So the now is actually very important. So in the sort of shepherding aspect of the early church, by sort of not mentioning it too much, they sort of made us concentrate on the now. It can't always have been a bad thing. But it does help one understand things now. If one looks at gems of the past and actually believes in reincarnation, that helps a lot. From material destiny to spiritual providence, one day at a time sweet Jesus the times I've gone into a marketplace or a shop and I've listened to that one day at a time sweet Jesus and that stops you in your tracks and you makes you address your now our work on the etheric with prayers and thoughts and feelings gathers forth and manifests itself back to us as a sort of um, reward a, a immediate sort of karma if you like um, Mind is the build egg, the case you always used to say, and we build so much with our mind, and we get back from the law of grace what it thinks we deserve. We don't always know the results of the things we do, we just have to give it up to our guardian angels, etc. And the rest, fortunately, happens without our having to interfere all the time. Let go and let God. That saying, if the, if the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak well if it's actually true spirit the spirit is blooming strong and it's a misquotation that one um, Plato very much said that if you get somebody else moves you and you move that's okay and if you move somebody else without moving yourself that's okay but if you move yourself from your own motivation that is really moving so again, that's how much control we ought to be having of our own lives. In Child of Eternity, a book about an autistic child, I don't know whether anybody else has read it. You have. Well, she, as a fetus, did not want to incarnate, and she shut down her endocrine system. She dug her heels in, and so she, when she was born, she was autistic. But in her 12th year, she, using a computer and a facilitator, allowed her to tell us all this that she went through, her previous lives as well. But this coming into our incarnation, because we've sort of volunteered to, Steiner and Casey say, you get a yearning to come back. Now, you know, I find that quite hard to believe, but never mind. We get a yearning to leave, and we also get this yearning to come back which actually keeps this wheel continually spinning we were in, a, in Ireland and a very rural area a lovely Irish farmer was looking at the Celtic cross and explaining to us that the Celtic cross has the sun drawn around it in a circle because they, we used to worship the spiritual sun and I thought here am I <laughs> in the middle of Ireland and he's talking as if he's sort of read all these spiritual books that are going around now about the spiritual sun rather than the physical sun and when you see a sunburst you think we think yes they just worship the physical sun but no they didn't they knew what the spiritual sun was too um, and in Wales you've got a heel at Stonehenge you've got the heel stone H-E-O-L now in Wales heel is a way so the sun is our way. It shines on our way, but it also shows us the way and gives us that Christ energy that came down with Jesus, that Jesus took on and held for three years. So there's a wonderful sort of a follow-up of the sun. And in pa on page 91 of the Awakening Letters, which again, has anybody read the Awakening Letters? The first volume, Mrs. K. But there's a spot on Iona. 
where the Druids are trying to teach people how not to come back. And she's writing on, um, on a little part of Iona where the Druids were, who were Columba's first friends. They are singing the old chants on the etheric which give power and health and enlightenment to the island. They are a wonderful group. One cannot easily tell a Druid from a Christian by the aura, except that the Druids have a deeper knowledge of the ancient wisdom, while the Christians have the Christ ray. This was very infectious. The Druids were very high order of mystics, and through them they were trying to tell us the secrets uh, that on long ago were teaching people actually how not to come back. Um, <laughs> but again, that's knowledge that we've all lost, isn't it? Ancient wisdom. Yeah, oh yes, how to get off. The Tibetans have actually come out of Tibet to sort of bring Buddhism very much into our sort of our knowledge again. One of these so-called secrets lies in a method of development taught by them which helped the soul on leaving the body to pass outside the earth aura and continue without reincarnation. So, you know, that I thought was, was, was lovely. I have been to Iona several times and having read that I sort of thought, well, I wonder where all this sort of mystery and where these messages may be left in the etheric for, for us to pick up. Talking about Stonehenge again, um, the English colony is a, a chapter in the Old Testament, Edgar Cayce's interpretation of the Old Testament. And there's a whole lot of people who come back into England around Hezekiah and Zedekiah's time and they come to Stonehenge and to Salisbury and to Glastonbury. And they bring with them the Old Testament knowledge and all the building of the great stone altars, which Hezekiah actually had to smash up because people had begun worshipping the stones and not seeing the truth behind the stones. It's like worshipping an idol. People actually tend to think it's in the material physical. Mm. And when you watch somebody in front of even a Buddha, you, you, you can't help wondering, are they actually worshipping that great gold figure or actually are they worshipping everything I hope they're worshipping everything behind it we all have we art creates them sculptors create them we like creation as long as we don't stop that's stop right. there Jehovah wouldn't allow the Jews to make any image that's right and the Muslims still won't nope. there's no graven image in the Muslims either we're going to talk about the English colony that came over through the Old Testament and came to Salisbury because we're talking about reincarnation mm -hmm. and it's lovely to know that the reincarnation of people like Zedekiah's grandchildren came and brought those wonderful secrets and we have them anchored at Stonehenge. He gives a reading and the entity was in the Holy Land when there were those breaking up in the periods when the land was being sacked those groups who escaped in the ships that settled in portions of the English land near what is now Salisbury. So we're all talking about Stonehenge here. He was a record keeper. Another one entered for the preservation of and brought with him those manners of worship, those manners of preserving lives, in other words doctoring medicine skills, of econ economic laws that had been part of the experience of those people who were the fathers of the entity then in the name of Zedekiah. In the experience, the entity gained, but in the latter portion lost. Casey always tells us where they made their brownie points and where they lost out. Because, you know, just because you started on one way, the right way, I'm afraid temptation and everything is all around you. For the signs, the symbols, came to be rather for the purposes. And this person took on the symbols and actually didn't get lost the purpose behind the symbols at the end of his life. Apparently the migration stretched over a long period of time then from the Old Testament times like an underground railway Casey says and that you know I thought was interesting because he always brings things matter of fact down to earth so that you can pick them up. We as human beings as ordinary people can pick them up. Another person created places of refuge for groups because of the terrific hardship of all these people escaping from the land of Hezekiah and Palestine 
And the, another one, the entity, was with those people who sought refuge, is now at the English land in Somerset. The entity was with the groups who had come from even the Temple Watch in Jerusalem. And so they brought with them they sort of, uh, their ideas of worship. Another entity called Judith came in to get rid and discard blood sacrifice so that the, what was put on the altar wasn't ever actually, I don't think, human sacrifice with the British Druids. I think the French and the Gaulish Druids there might have been. But it was to bring the gifts, like the Hindus bring gifts. She was here to take away the blood sacrifices and get people to take on the, the real meanings of sacrifice. Another one was a prophetess given in the understanding and interest into the seasons and the zodiacal and the star knowledge she brought with her and that again to Stonehenge. Hence the entity gained, yet it, as it were, set as a temptation the symbols. In other words, people still got stuck on symbols. The better mental and spiritual interpretations of those things that have been handed down to people's as customs. So again, somebody's bringing the interpretations to keep the true meaning of them. Another person, the weakness of forcing the purposes. He forced his ideas upon people, so he lost in that life. Mm -hmm. But because what he was saying was true, he almost got a sort of a forgiveness. It was the paradox of karma. And here he goes and says, for this entity here, the altars upon which there was the cleansing of the bodies of individuals, the cleansing of their bodies, to get rid of hate, malice, selfishness, self-indulgence. These people were laid on the altars and cleansed in the body through ceremony, through the rise of initiates from the sources of light that came from the stones that came from the stones. Now, I found that interesting because stones are records. They hold all sorts of things. Mm. So these higher entities came from the stones upon which the angels of light during the periods gave their expression to the people. Okay. I mean, old-fashioned language. It is hard to understand. But it, it is fascinating that we've got the reincarnation of lives in England, in Stonehenge and Glastonbury. Avery, you'll find that too. But somehow, the people who went for readings to Edgar Casey, they hadn't been at Avery. I don't think there are any that he recorded coming from Avery. So, I mean, it obviously happened all over the place. Yes. And we have just such an interesting history. In reincarnation, unnecessary. That was a very fascinating life. Yes. In these 18 lives of people who reincarnation was unnecessary for, Practically everyone, I think there's only one that doesn't go to Egypt. But Egypt seems to be a very strong influence because the Egyptians were dealing very much with going out of the body, their life back to the, trying to get back to the spiritual. So they were trying to cut control of their astral body, obviously trying to get back because the way has been lost to get back. So they seem to have concentrated on this trying to get back to the spiritual origins. But this life is fascinating because it's been in Peru, Greece, Egypt, and England. I'm getting back to England because, you know, <laughs> this is where we live. Yes. But in Peru, when the land was sum submerging, from the, that life of this person came his interest in understanding the wishes and needs of groups of people and his ability to plead their causes. He then has a life in Egypt, especially as a historian. And then he has a life in Greece. He, here, warring led to his present awareness of reaping whatever one sows. But again, he was trying to help people, great bodies of people, with their individuality. And then he comes to the life in England. From a general in Greece, the counsellor, he's always counselling and helping people. The counsellor later becomes Oliver Cromwell. And I thought, well, it's lovely to have a well-known name. The late comes Oliver Cromwell, fighting for the principle of personal freedom. The previous life showed a pattern of dealing with people in large groups. In England, he learned to see them as individuals. 
That incarnation, he developed his interest in individuals' rights and responsibilities. He also carried over his predilection for giving his best. And we know that Cromwell had a terrible time with his conscience, whether he would lead against Charles I or whether he wouldn't. He was a very devout man. And so it's lovely every now and again when you're reading through the lives to come across one, you know, because one another life that was unnecessary for reincarnation again unless she volunteered was that of Martha, Lazarus' sister. Mm. And that, that I thought was good mm. because you can follow through. But in England, again, you see, I have to go back to England. In England she came in the time of Charles I. The reading said that she gained because she was able to aid the suffering members of the household. Here is the practical Martha again, doing what she sees to do wherever she is, relieving fear, teaching, offering spiritual guidance. She also helped in material ways when necessary, acting also as a spy. The life in England enabled her to broaden her insight and heighten her Martha characteristic of not wasting time talking when things needed to be done. I thought that was, that was quite good. And so it is a time when we are thinking about it very much because the orthodox teachings of the church that are taught in churches is not enough for us. So we now go outside into the holy books of every creed and every race to find the universal truth because the Christ energy, as I said, was left for everybody. Because you and I carry the Christ energy, we all know that it is here and we can sort of carry on. I also think we bank every time we, are, we have a lifetime, we bank the best of us and our higher self is on the other side. And when we die, we meet our higher self and we don't always recognize it for quite a while. But there's some lovely stories of people who've been in contact with their higher selves and just can't believe that they managed to bank because you don't do it consciously all your good points you don't realize how much of a not a personality it's your individuality you're building up on the other side so that when you finish with your personality it's all banked and it just reminded me of a lovely story we used to sing in a pub when somebody had a false eye and a false leg and everything on them, the wig, etc. And the song goes that when they got into bed at night, side by side, she took off her leg and she took off her, at her eye and she took off her hair. And in the end, the song says, I slept on the chair. There was more of her there. <laughs> side by side. And so we too have banked so much of us up into our high selves over many lives that it is actually very encouraging. So we probably see the big issues that are our destiny. And it's, it's great that it's like one of those ostriches with weights and a drink of water. They start bending, they have weights in them, and yeah. suddenly when they go over a point, they go down. And it's like that. If you've made so much of yourself given into the higher world, you probably find that reincarnation is unnecessary. And that's at a point you choose whether you come back or not. Interesting other lives, Elijah and John the Baptist. And when you read Casey's life readings on them, the way that Elijah, that's in the Bible too, he picked up his skirts and he ran from Jezebel. He was frightened of Jezebel because he'd slain all her prophets. Now, Elijah comes back as John the Baptist. Jesus tells us of that at the Transfiguration. Jesus did not rescue John the Baptist when he was thrown into prison. Jezebel came back as Herod's wife. So she got Elijah then, but he was then John the Baptist. Jesus didn't rescue John from the prison because Jesus knew what Elijah, John the Baptist, karma was. He, even he didn't escape karma. Karma is a good, you get good karma and bad karma that you always have to address it. It's a third great influence. And then when Jesus asked, whom do they say that I am? Now, how many people do you know that ask other people who they are? So you see, reincarnation was understood in the New Testament times. And a man born blind, he couldn't have sinned in the womb. 
And so Jesus says, the disciples presume that, you know, he did something wrong in his karmic, in his previous lives. But Jesus says, no, he came so that the works of God might be made manifest. So we can't always think that anybody with a handicap has done something bad. There's always other reasons. We just don't know. In the awakening letters, Joe, who Sir Alvary Gascoigne, was a monk with Columba, and he tells us about an on Iona, and he tells us about those. But the one, one of the fascinating ones is um, Anne Boleyn. First of all, this lady comes to Casey in the 30s and she's given a life, first of all, as Hannah, the mother of Samuel. And that, she eventually has a son. And then he tells her that she comes in as Anna, the prophetess, who had no children, waiting in the temple, but recognized the Christ. Then she comes in as Anne Boleyn, who desperately wanted a son, like Hannah had desperately wanted Samuel. And each time this lady gives birth to wonderful lives, people who have great lives, like Samuel. And Anne Boleyn gave birth to Elizabeth I, that did so much for the Reformation in bringing the Bible and the Word to us as people instead of the Roman Catholic Church dictating what was said in the Bible because it was all in Latin and nobody understood it. So the Reformation was another wonderful evolutionary leap for mankind and Anne Boleyn was very, very active. She backed William Tyndale. She got the importation of the work he was doing in Holland, bought it in secretly. She risked so much but she also was a very active lady and very, as you know she loved riches she wanted to be queen to be a mistress of Henry VIII was not enough and the reading of this child that was brought to Edgar Casey says that she always wanted her own way Hannah was determined as Samuel's mother she offered that if she conceived the child would go to God but she was a very strong lady he says and one that will be inclined to judge and measure activities. Hence the spiritual lessons of this lifetime for her must be developed through the activities of the entity in the material plane on how, why and why the entity could ever be materially minded. Katie doesn't understand at all because her previous life was so spiritual. But new and subtle dimensions of interest accrue when life readings contain incarnations of persons who are familiar to us and we start understanding them. Anna the prophetess, she suffered in mind and body for the spiritual ideal but this lady who's, who was Anne Boleyn is giving birth. He says to her, you'll give birth to a very important child and later on when she marries and has children she has very precocious children who, who are obviously going to be an exception again. Now, unfortunately, we have no more records after 1945 because that's when Edgar Cayce died. Now, if in the ARE she goes back, it would be interesting much later to find out what happened to the children that this lady of today has given birth to because as Hannah, she gave birth to Samuel. As Anna, she recognized the Christ. And as Anne Boleyn, she gave birth to Elizabeth I. But it may come out or it may not. That's just a picture of Anne Boleyn. Lots of people thought that the Jews who came back in the Holocaust were, I'm afraid, the inquisit inquisitors of the Roman Catholic Inquisition. Another interesting getting together of great souls is Franco during the Spanish Civil War. They came from all corners of the earth. And people say that they were probably the conquistadors who went into South America and played such havoc. Their karma was balanced when they came back and all got together again. So, because apparently we reincarnate with often the same souls. And um, you look up your family tree and you think, gosh, you know, 
I wonder which one was me before. <laughs> you, as you, will choose to probably reincarnate with people like Nigel again next time, people who've meant something to you and whose business you actually haven't finished. So you carry on with that person almost where you left off without an awful lot of memory of it. Understanding is the wellspring of life and the more we can understand through reincarnation, the greater our understanding increases. Life doesn't make sense without it, nor does it make sense of divine justice. Our future is built on our past our present and we certainly can't accomplish this huge task of man's evolution in one lifetime man know thyself and you will know God and the universe we're told and Anne, when I had a reading and Anne Perry gave me one or two of my past lives she says you know all about reincarnation but she says do you live as if you believe it and I thought wow that's up putting something right at my doorstep so I have thought of that, and often I don't live as if I believe it. And if I can get myself into the mindset of believing it, I actually sort of make different choices. Because when I, when I come back, I want it to be a better world, so I know I've got to be effective. It's like a tablecloth, you know. If you raise the middle of a tablecloth, you raise everybody around you. So if you can raise yourself in your life and help mankind, you actually raise their vibration as well. And in the incarnating lessons where Patricia tells us, laughter sets up a series of bubbles in the ether which reflect light and color like a waterfall to drop in tinkling cascades of thought into the ether which is gathered and sent back to the physical. So our laughter is sent back, gathered together in the etheric and sent back to us as a good lifting thing. Ella Wheeler Wilcox, the poet, said people are either lifters or leaners. Mm -hmm. And she didn't actually make any other definition. She says you're either a lifter or a leaner. We all take turns at being both, I think. But at one period, at one aspect of your life, you can see periods when you've leaned heavily and other times when you've lifted. The people who are brave enough to speak out like Glenn Hoddle and David Icke and Shirley MacLaine from famous positions do help a lot of other people because the publicity they generate actually gets through to so many people and even if like a lot of people say the Shirley MacLaine books used to drop out of the shelves for them mm -hmm. and they'd pick them up we have to be brave enough to ask the difficulties to overcome because reincarnation actually teaches us and difficulties teach us we have been all sexes all creeds all colors so that actually should make us tolerant so if we become patient and tolerant, then that helps us an awful lot in understanding as well as each other. And so if we deny very strongly as life progression that there's life on the other side and that more to life, if we deny it in this life very strongly, we will not be able to live, live this life fully. We will remain imprisoned longer in the very aspect of ourselves that has to die our personality because by being too strong in denial you actually encase yourself like in a little box and there are many souls who die that find themselves in a case love relationships and learning is what we're all about and it's so important we'll be, we will be asked not what did you do in the war daddy we will be asked what would, would, did you do with your life when you get onto the other side to further the evolution of your, your friends as well because we will reap the results when we return definitely of what we sow. No work or development is ever wasted as I said it is stored in your higher self so that it is there for you. The Akashic records some people can read but I'm afraid I can't. Betty Edie was not allowed to remember her life purpose when she had a near-death experience because it would have made her impatient. She would have wanted to carry on and do things too quickly. So this, the impatience, is something that it, we need to get rid of, like we need to get rid of expectations. We need to get rid, rid of the word should. We should have done this. We should or somebody else should have done if God controlled the world, it would be perfect. But unfortunately, it's a 
Our life is in our hands, like our children. We can't control them utterly. They have free will. And so the great spirits reincarnate, Ivanov says, in the lands where they are needed. They are needed, like, like we give aid to de undeveloped countries. The higher spirits come back to countries that need them to help those countries move on. People like Abraham Lincoln, who came back to unite the North and the South and to get rid of slavery. Yes. And that was, he was murdered by the Jesuits, unfortunately, but each, he knew he was being murdered, so, you know, he knew he had a task to do, that he would probably do it and then go. And when I was told, read that Ruth Montgomery said that Abe Lincoln was at walk-in, I'd never heard of a walk-in. And it's when a higher soul comes in to help a body who has a very difficult task. And I thought, well, I don't know about that, you know. So I went to um, Alistair Cook's book on America, and I opened it. Uh, you know, I opened it, and there was Abraham Lincoln looking at a big photograph out at me. So I read what it said, the text next to it, and it said, from this moment onward, Abraham Lincoln's speech is changed. And I thought, oh yes, I came to this book with a specific question, and I got an answer. And I am awake enough not to say rubbish when I get given something like that, because often I had gone out with a question, and I want it to be answered. Well, basically boring stuff, like when I lost my purse for three days, so I hadn't actually dared tell my husband. <laughs> and I got back into Sherburne, having all this loose change in my handbag, which I hated. And I sat down in the car, and I said, please, guardian angel, just, you know, give me a clue where my purse might be. And I just looked down at my hands, and my left hand was on the rug on the seat on the car. And I could feel my purse under that rug. Oh, well, I just burst out laughing. Life is fun when you actually become awake and get on your bike with pumped up tires and get things rolling. And it's, that's what, what makes the joy of life, actually. Lots of people have done work on reincarnation. People like Dr. Even, Ian Stevenson, who actually is an old man now, and he said, even after all this, he cannot quite believe it. And if any of you have read his books, there's, there's volumes on reincarnation. Proof, especially in India, where it's easy to find because it's part of their culture. Raymond Moody also has done a lot of work on it. And in The Boy Who Saw True, it was quite interesting because he has this spiritual vision and his grandpa, who's dead, comes back to him. And so they say, oh, let's ask grandpa about reincarnation. And Ranka, grandpa says, oh, I don't know anything about that. And so Boyd says, well, how come he's on the other side and he doesn't know about it? And so there's obviously different levels of understanding. Mm. And Grandpa has only just died and gone over to the first two or three astral levels, probably. And he hasn't gone higher to learn. He hasn't yet gone to the halls of learning that you read about later on. But that was very interesting that Grandpa didn't know about reincarnation. Joe Fisher and Dr. Witten did an awful lot, lot on reincarnation and you've got the soul that is wait, has chosen and is waiting for its mother and it's looking down on a very pregnant lady who's gathering water and having, carrying a pail that is too heavy for her and the soul is so worried that the body that it has chosen to go into, the baby, will miscarry because she's carrying too heavy a bucket of water. So the the spirit goes in and out during pregnancy. It's not always in there. And I don't think it's really in there, finally, in every case, till the moment of the first breath. And by then, but even in a baby, it goes in and out of the body. Children and accidental deaths, especially in India, tend to come back quickly. And there's many stories of children who come back, or a, a mother who lost a child has a baby, but she can't bring herself to throw away the toys and the when they come back they call a dolly the child is given a dolly and calls it the same name as the child that died did and there's just numerous ca case histories like that which are great fun to read if you're in that sort of mood there was a documentary not long ago and one of the little boys 
um, was called Tutu. He bore the scars of his death, the shooting on his temple. He was a little boy in India, and he kept on about this life he'd had in a shop, a radio shop. He knew the address, he knew the town. His wife was still alive. This was a boy of about six. So in the end, the present parents took him back. They went to this radio shop at this address. There was his wife that he recognized, a full-grown woman. And they made, they made a bit of fun of him. You know, they took it lightly. But he, and he was very, very shy, but he gradually came out with presents he had given her as a husband. And he went through his death that he'd been shot by a jealous rival about business. And the shot wound he had was in his head. Um, and they shaved his head, and there exactly, as the medical documents had said, was this, this scar. So that was work of Dr. Ian, Ian, Ian Stevenson as well. And then you get people coming in in early incarnations of first-timers. And one of the books I was reading said that they often come in as observers, either with cerebral palsy, where they're looked after and they just watch, or with Down syndrome, where they don't take such an active part, but they are looked after. And I had never thought of Down's children and, and, and handicaps as being young souls who were coming in as observers because they often you often volunteer to come in as handicapped to teach those around you how to behave teach those around you patience and all the things that they need to learn and you get the indigo children today who are coming in with different eyes different understanding who seem to be way ahead of the average person like us who've got a very deep understanding and so when poor old Glenn Hoddle got into all that trouble, when he was brave enough to speak his truth, um, he forgot to say that, they didn't give him a chance probably, that sometimes a handicapped person is a great soul who comes back in. And I think they obviously wanted to get rid of him for, out of his football activities. And by putting him up for being pilliard, he, they sort of got rid of him that way. So upon death, we get a life review. That's the first thing. They called it, or well, they call it descended to hell or whatever, um, and it's our own judgment. We are our judge and our own jury. We get help, but nobody judges us but ourselves and our own moral code. And when um, you go to the spiritual this church and you get people being helped with grief, etc. Um, that is a great stopgap. It's not where you stay, but it's a time when you look on to just that little aspect of life and get the help from the other side you need. Each time I've gone to a spiritualist church with a question, I've got it. I've got the answer. I hadn't believed it at the time, but it just happens every time. And when my father has just died, and a very orthodox Christian, and he had ideas of what happened to life after death, and reincarnation. I tried to teach, tell him, but he wouldn't listen to me. And a friend was with uh, a healer, who Paul Tandy, some of you may know, who was sitting. And Aaron said, "Can you tell me about my friend Eric? You know, he was he was buried today. How is he getting on in the fortnight he's been gone?" And Paul Tandy came back and said, "Actually, he's suffering from shock because it's not as he thought it was." He was a church warden and very orthodox and he had definite ideas and he was actually just in a sort of shock, a delayed action if you like. And of what like nature, Alan asked again, how was he? And he said, he's fine. He was open-minded. He saw what was in front of him. He had a very strict moral code and so that stood him in good stead. So fine, he's gone on to the halls of learning. And he said a very throwaway remark, which spiritualist jargon tends to be every day, and he's catching up with his reading. Now, for some people, that phrase wouldn't have meant a thing, but Daddy couldn't read for the last 18 months. And he, that bugged him every single day of his life. So that little phrase, mm. ah, and he's catching up with his reading, was spot on. And I said, it made me a lot happier, because you get all the help you can, 
to get out and to understand your life that has just gone before you start going up into the astral and the spiritual planes to prepare for the next life. Apparently when you're right out in the spiritual you get this terrific yearning to come back and help mankind and his evolution again. Just like my old mother today at the old people's home, she has a yearning to go. So there is a time for every season and a season for everything under heaven. There's a time to go, but there's a yearning that happens at the beginning and the end of each journey. And when we leave on the etheric, people like Florence Nightingale apparently are helping people undo their etheric bodies from their physical so that it's taken off into the etheric plane intact. But people like Mary Baker Eddy, who was a great Christian scientist, and she had one or two things that she said that weren't actually true, and she sort of knew they weren't true. She is in the welcome group, if you like, to meet Christian scientists, to actually explain to them what she said that was wrong, which I thought was fascinating. Because when I first read that, I went back into the Christian science books and onto Mary Baker Eddy's life. And, you know, it was just one of those things that she did what she had to do, but she got the personality and the pride leading her astray. She got too much into the personality, which is every temptation that we all have. And a ghost that we see as a ghost for those who do, people who are trapped in time, is really a disassociated fragment of a personality that has become split off from the rest and remains imprisoned in a timeless present. So when people do spiritual rescue and send a ghost back into the light, it is a fragment of themselves that for some reason a great, great pull or accident or trauma keeps them there. So it's a fragment of the whole personality. Poltergeist, of course, is the disturbing energies that are generated from teenagers and emotionally upset people. Um, but that's generated from here, not from the other side. Visitations and visions, an aspect with sufficient will to manifest with a message. So that when you get somebody, a relative, or somebody very close to you, coming back and standing, say, at the end of your bed, and saying something to you, and you think you're dreaming, but and other people I know have actually seen it. It's a sort of vision. That is an aspect from somebody strong whose sufficient will to manifest, because manifestation, once you've gone, takes an awful lot of purity as well as everything else. So whether they are stuck and what gets them on, people who do spiritual healing can move them on so that reincarnation for them becomes possible because presumably if you've left a little bit behind you might not be able to start the process of coming back. God the divinity is almost like a wheel, just how I started. When we are on this wheel and in a spoke we go into the hub, back to the source and then when reincarnation comes again, you come down another spoke to go again onto the karmic wheel. The, most of it is beyond our ken, but at the Tippling Philosopher a little while ago, um, Ian Lawton was talking about Dr. Michael Newton, and he uses a lot of children who've given their past and what they can see over on the other side. And apparently, we return to something like a chandelier, which is like a family. Our light, which is our individuality, goes back onto a sort of chandelier. And you can tell on this chandelier those who are in incarnation and those who are not. Because if the light on this chandelier is dim, that person is incarnation down on the earth at the moment, which I thought was a fascinating idea. And happiness gives a yearning to return so that if we were happy presumably from over there we yearn to return for the happy moments and something draws us to the happiness we know when we were one with our source nature shows us we keep turning and returning to return to serve in the evolution of mankind in whatever capacity we choose so judge not anybody because Otherwise, ye yourself will be judged. We are warned many times. Judge not, aren't we? 
karma is a paradox because we have good karma people tend to talk about karma as if it's always bad but it's actually not it's good you can have a lot of good like putting banking up like the weakest link you bank yes. into your higher self reincarnation is a fascinating subject with a, which is ongoing tonight we are creating our next life love of God gives us many chances be ye perfect my yoke is easy my burden is light so why the hell do we make it so difficult if we give up our pride and our self we enter a new way of thinking and living which then offers us a whole lot more challenges stick with the now it will influence your next reincarnation so by doing this with you tonight and sharing what I have learned and experienced I'm actually building something into my next incarnation. What it is, I don't know yet. <laughs> and luckily, there are lots of things we aren't to know because it would be too much. It really would. But our relationship to each other is just so important. No man is really an island. Even if we're trying to be whole and balancing our male and female aspects, we still need each other. Um, it is sort of um, like a sleep, the reincarnation almost, like you go to bed at night and as I said, your, your astral and your spiritual body leave you and they come back in the morning. So there you have a going and a coming back. Everything, like the tide, goes and come back. And we just echo nature in everything we do. Beware of hypnotism, beware of regression, go for regression with somebody you really trust because sometimes we can sort of hypnotize ourselves into believing all that we are saying. There are no shortcuts, experience is our teacher and it's no good thinking we can assume the lotus position for a few moments and instantly find yourself in constant contact with the infinite. You may be convinced or even have hypnotized yourself into believing this, but the steady, long journey of learning, testing, understanding, and living with loving kindness brings the law of grace to meet us, to change us, and actually to help us home. So, if we can live very simply with loving kindness, and not be aware of how many brownie points or anything else we're getting. Forget that side. You've got a higher self. You've got your guardian angel. And you've got your God that is actually seeing to that side. So it's living in the moment, everybody. Like living in the now. Because now is all we have at the moment.